Uh, what I want to talk to you uh, about in my brief time is uh, the Scholarly Communication Institute. And I'll echo um, some comment, a comment that was made by uh, Peter Brantley, the executive director of the Digital Library Federation, uh, yesterday in um, his opening remarks. And that is for SCI, for the Scholarly Communication Institute, video is uh, somewhat a, a new development and we're thinking with the communities that we're working with how we're really going to integrate that where it makes uh, sense to integrate it. And in some respects, what I'm talking to you about is a social process with scholars uh, that we've been going through. The Scholarly Communication Institute is a six-year project, and <coughs> we're currently in our fifth year, and it's been generally, generously funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. It's housed at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, uh, even though I divide my time between San Francisco and Cape Cod. Uh, and I will, uh, I guess, explain uh, a little later on uh, what I mean by housed at the University of Virginia. One of the uh, motivating factors of Mellon wanting to fund this institute was the desire of those of us who had been working with individual projects over the years, innovative projects uh, in digital scholarship, to move uh, the scholarly communities beyond individual projects and to move them really to a cultural change. And both we and uh, Mellon were interested in doing that. To uh, just give you some background um, on myself so you understand the uh, perspective I'm coming from, I spent most of my career as a university librarian at places like UC San Francisco, uh, Dartmouth College, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Medical Institution, uh, and I was the founding university librarian for the California Digital Library and the founding of uh, University of California's e-scholarship uh, program. Before that, I had worked on uh, what were considered very forward-looking uh, electronic projects like the Red Sage Project, which was one of the first uh, large journal uh, projects, electronic journal product projects that brought together uh, 20 medical and scientific publishers and created a very large database and critical mass of content uh, for people to move forward and, and was really kind of proof of concept uh, back in the 90s of uh, would electronic journals uh, really work and were faculty and students really interested in them. And I know for many of you here that seems like something that that's just a given and fortunately it is for people. Prior to that I spent much of my time uh, in the medical arena and with the Human Genome Project in developing um, databases and resources and social spaces uh, for human genetics researchers and molecular biologists. And I did this all from the platform uh, of the library because my strong feeling is that the library needs to be at the center of all scholarship. Uh, and even though there are parts of me that become dismayed when I see what happens in the real world, uh, that very much drives me uh, as well. The Scholarly Communication Institute, uh, I think it's useful uh, you know, to define, first of all, what we're really about. We're really about scholarly communication. And what that means to us anyway is a cyclical process uh, that takes uh, researchers, uh, faculty members, scholars through the research and discovery process, analysis, presentation, preservation, dissemination, access and use, and all the way again in a cyclical fashion back to research and discovery. And this is a process that's been in existence uh, in some form or another for many, many years. And the digital revolution has had a real <coughs> significant impact on various parts of this process at different times, depending upon what technology you're talking about. In the Scholarly Communication Institute, we deal primarily uh, with humanities scholars. 
And the reason of that, uh, one reason for that, of course, is Mellon's interest in the arts and humanities. And one of the most difficult things that we have to deal with with humanities scholars is the notion of scholarship as a collaborative process and not as an individual enterprise. When I worked with the scientific community, there was not much need uh, to uh, put emphasis and focus on that. Uh, but there is indeed in the humanities, and it takes our working with groups of scholars for long periods of time uh, before many of them are really able to make that change, at least in certain institu institu uh, situations. The overall goal of the institute is to create an opportunity for scholars to understand and embrace digital scholarship. We just don't want to have them sit around a room and talk about digital scholarship, talk about why they can't do di digital scholarship, or what they can't do, or what, or what latest technology has caused them problems. But we actually want to take them from where they are to doing things. We assist the scholars by bringing together with the scholars uh, leadership from scholarly societies, research libraries, advanced technologies, experts in the critical arenas such as copyright, higher education leadership that often holds the resource uh, key, uh, and private industry. Uh, more and more we're trying to bring private industry into this process. <clears throat> to uh, what we refer to as an institute, and over the six years there are six institutes, there is a summer meeting, and that meeting is always held at the University of Virginia, and that's in some respects why we say this is housed at the University of Virginia. We invite a very small group, uh, hopefully no more than 25, and at least 60% of those to be working scholars, to a very conversational kind of meeting. We early on ply them with food and alcohol and find that they are very cooperative uh, during the entire rest of the time. What we hope to do with that is to create some communities of action that are then going to go out in a disciplinary way, not in an individual scholar kind of way on a particular project, to create some real advances in digital scholarship, whether you're talking about digital scholarship as, uh, you know, at the initial phase of research and discovery, or you're talking about it from a publication phase, et cetera. We also bring to the summer meeting uh, usually uh, three to six graduate students. And we find that the graduate students uh, have a tremendous impact on the senior scholars in uh, attempting to explain to them uh, what they really need for their careers uh, to develop and how they would like to develop their careers and what the constraints are for them if they can't practice digital scholarship uh, in moving their ideas forward, creating new knowledge and new analysis. I'm going to single out a couple of uh, institutes that we did uh, so you can see how this progresses. If I go back to the second one, SCI2, it was on practical ethics. ethics. And practical ethics are things like uh, biomedical ethics, and other, uh, journalistic ethics, uh, environmental ethics, legal ethics, business ethics. Uh, in other words, applying uh, ethical standards uh, in various fields. We brought together a group of practical ethicists from all those kinds of areas in different institutions. And this was a group that essentially uh, had rarely used the technology except potentially to access some citation database. And we tried to immerse them uh, immediately in what all the possibilities might be. And the discussions for those two, two days were um, really quite significant. And they also had a significant effect on what those scholars did when they left the institute. The second thing that we try to do with them is create communities of action. And we created two communities of action, uh, a, a group from biomedical ethics and now a group from journalistic, journalistic ethics. And the real advance in digital scholarship that we're working on with them three years later still uh, is the creation of ethics share which is really uh, a community uh, space uh, and also a very large resource uh, of all kinds of digital information from citation-based to full text, 
uh, to video, uh, to newspaper, uh, to Flickr images, uh, everything uh, really that's out there. And we're in the planning and prototype phase with them uh, at this stage. And what's been really critical is not to have an institute whereby we bring these people together and then let them go. But you know, when, once they get home, we want to make sure that they're continually brought together from across those institutions and continue to work on some of these questions. The fourth institute last year was in architectural history. And there are probably some more immediate uh, applications with respect to video and architectural history. What we brought together was a group of architectural historians. And early on when we were planning the institute, we had hoped to bring together architectural historians and architects, uh, given the fact of everything that's happened with uh, architectural design, uh, the fact that most, uh, most plans and most as-builts these days are in digital form. But there's such a gulf, uh, a, a distance in how people think, how, how architectural historians think, uh, and uh, how, how architects, practicing architects, even in the academic uh, environment think, that we felt that we couldn't bridge that gap. Well, that was uh, kind of a noble thing to do, that we would concentrate on architectural history. Um, I, I've I've uh, left the communities of action the wrong one here. The communities of action that we created were really around uh, a community of action with respect to publication and a community of action with respect to knowledge gathering. Uh, and the real advances that we're trying to make in digital scholarship with respect to architectural history is the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians Online um, is uh, now being developed. Uh, in accordance with Artstore, uh, which I'm uh, sure you understand was also developed as a Mellon project. And this is not just an online journal. Uh, rather, uh, because the journal in its you know, current print form is already online. But this is now a journal that is seeking and working with submissions that come in very different technological forms because people in uh, architectural history and architecture and classics and other kinds of areas uh, you know, are really dealing a lot with computer modeling and design. And so it becomes a very different kind of resource for people to access and also a very different kind of resource for people to begin uh, to publish in, to get their work out in, that there was no place for them to get their work out in before. The other is in the creation of an architecture visual resource network. And the notion here is to capture the work of scholars uh, as they begin to capture information themselves. Architectural historians go everywhere with their cameras. Uh, they now go everywhere with their digital cameras. They also go everywhere with their camera phones now. Uh, and they also go everywhere with some kind of video device. And what ARVN uh, will be is a resource that allows people to input all of those resources to have some vetting process that then moves them from what the architectural historians are calling a pig pile, just that information that gets brought from everywhere else and vetted into a database that's available for access that's been sanctioned by the Society of Architectural Historians. And again, we're working with Artstore uh, and we're also, we're following two models really, the art store model, which is a more traditional model, and the Flickr model. And we're able to compare uh, what kinds of things, uh, you know, the differences and the values of uh, tagging versus uh, very structured metadata, uh, things that are just out there and easily captured versus uh, image quality that needs to be, uh, images that need to be of such quality uh, to be able to publish, uh, et cetera, et cetera. SCI 5, which happens this summer, takes a slightly different tack. Rather than, um, rather than take a discipline, we're taking uh, the notion of visual studies across disciplines. Uh, because 
our understanding and our belief is that the visual, whether it's in still form or moving form, is, is a really critical area for universities and academic institutions to deal with, both in uh, developing uh, an infrastructure to support them, uh, and providing other kinds of support for faculty and students, et cetera. And so we're bringing scholars who work with media together, uh, visual media together. Some of the scholars come from video, some come uh, out of the video world, some come out of the film world, some come out of new media, new media art, some come from simulations, they're using 3D, they use standard photography. Uh, and, and we really want to focus them in on what, what's the critical aspect uh, of visual media is for their work, what are the research agendas that need to be developed in order to really understand the infrastructures that need to, put, need to be put into place. And one of the things that we've been able to do uh, in this institute that we weren't with architectural historians is to bring together both theorists and practitioners. And in fact, out of the 25 people that we have coming to the institute, we did not invite anybody who was either a theorist or a practitioner, but people who were both theorists and practitioners because uh, we feel that that integration of the two uh, is absolutely critical to moving forward. And what we hope to develop this summer is now a community of action, which is our visual scholarship community of action. And until we have that summer institute meeting, we really don't know uh, what the communities of action are, are, are going to exactly look like and what kind of real advances we think we can make with that community of action. Um, one of the ones that's clearly on our mind right now is the development of a research agenda because uh, we think that that's really key. NSF is very interested in that. Uh, in addition to Mellon, uh, uh, NEH is very interested. Uh, as you may know, they have a major new program that they're announcing on uh, centers for uh, digital humanities and they don't have much money yet because they don't know what it is they want to do and we really want to influence them, have the scholars influence them and give these scholars who are at that meeting this summer a community to go back and do that with. The last institute uh, is going to be held in uh, the summer of 2008 and it really focuses on the notion of centers of excellence. I imagine that most of you are familiar with the cyber infrastructure report that came out of the American Council of Learning Societies on the notion of cyber infrastructure in the social sciences and humanities. And that was really developed on a model from one that had come previously from NSF on cyber infrastructure in the sciences. And some of the recommendations that are in there have to do with the creation of centers of excellence, but it doesn't specify what the centers of excellence are, what they would do, where they would be. And what we're in the process of doing right now is working closely with ACLS, the Council on Library and Information Resources, um, Mellon, NEH, NSF, uh, people who uh, work now with the Centers for Digital Humanities, and coming up with a number of models for what those centers might be. And some of those models, frankly, may center around specific technologies. So that we need to have a center of excellence uh, that focuses on video or that uh, focuses on textual information, et cetera. We'll move forward with those models and create communities of action that will then have a set of strategies to make sure funding gets put in place by both federal and private agencies and that implementation begins to move forward. SCI is not only about discussion, it's really uh, about making something happen and making something happen in the broad community and trying to leverage what has been done in individual projects at many of the institutions uh, previous to this. Thank you. <laughs>